And still talking COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the health, uh, it is a health crisis and human crisis uh, threatening the food security and nutrition of uh, millions of people around the world. In Nigeria, it has an aggravating effect as border closures, lockdowns and uh, loss of jobs have reduced food access and supply. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, this disruption can result in consequences for health and nutrition. Joining us uh, via Skype is founder Leap Africa and managing partner Sahel Health Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited, Ndidi Nguneli. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And also joining us in the studio is Pascal Achunine, CEO of Health Emergency Initiative. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. All right, I will begin with you, uh, Ndidi Nguneli. Uh, there's been reports, like we know, uh, COVID-19 has caused a lot of disruption, affected lives, property, jobs, and even food and nutrition. And uh, before then, the Nigeria has the, the issue of self-sufficiency had been of a major concern, uh, especially in Nigeria. And now coupled with the pandemic, how critical is the crisis we are facing when we are talking food security? Good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here. We are facing a critical crisis, not just from COVID-19, but from the rising insecurity in the country, which has affected farmers across Nigeria. According to the World Food Program, about 13.8 million people across 15 states would likely be in the critical phase of food and nutrition insecurity from June to August 2021. And one third of these people are in Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe state. We are also seeing rising inflation um, across the country, and this has affected our food security as well. According to the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, close to 60% of household income is spent on food. And with inflation rates at 15%, it means that food prices have doubled in some parts of the country or risen by between 20 and 50%, which makes it unaffordable for those already struggling to even feed their families three square meals a day. And so we're seeing a lot of families reducing what their intake is, which affects their health status and also makes them vulnerable to a lot of illnesses. So there's a crisis at hand and we need urgent attention, urgent action from key stakeholders. Yes, let's bring the conversation to the studio now. Urgent attention and urgent intervention from key stakeholders. But before we get there, uh, food and nutrition crisis, like she pointed out, and we already have a fragile health system that is already uh, heating, uh, that the pandemic is heating hard already. Now, what do you see? What kind of picture do you see? Is it seeing that we already have a food and nutrition uh, crisis uh, at hand? If you look at uh, what happened during the ENSA's uh, protest and uh, the, the palliative crisis and looting of uh, warehouses, it uh, clearly revealed the deep poverty and hunger in the land. Right. But between then and now, uh, more horrible things have happened that have affected the average Nigerian. If you look at the, the hike in energy, electricity, mm -hmm. and the fuel, uh, all of these have concomitant effect on the price of food Big items. items yes. um, so let's take example, egg. Egg was probably about 30 naira per one then. Most places you buy egg at 60 to 70 naira. And that's perhaps the easiest access to protein that uh, most Nigerians could have for the same applies to beans. So we bring it back home. Has there been any policy action at uh, the from the point, standpoint of policymakers to address this challenge, especially recognizing that we've been on recession, whether we are out of it or not, that's a different matter. But indicators show that we are clearly having an emergency. And one out of every child, zero to five child in Nigeria, have retarded growth. So that was the statistics. We had it as at 2019, early 2020. Right now, it's likely that that uh, would get worse. So we would have more crises, especially, it's also important as she point, pointed out, between uh, September, October, when we had that crisis or the protest, yes. and now, access to 
food centers or agri locations where food producing uh, activities happen have been limited because of insecurity. So the hunger will increase, scarcity of food will increase, and I have not yet seen a broad-based policy action or collaborative mechanism put in place to address these gaps. Because even those who typically produce in certain locations, they don't go to their farms anymore. Many are scared of going, many have been killed. And so we are having an emergency that needs immediate fixing. And we are not yet seeing any policy action on that. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, the palliatives, uh, and this is part of uh, one of the safety net programs uh, of government at addressing issues like this, because uh, government is talking about earmarking, I think about 500 billion for palliatives uh, as we're well, moving forward. And I bring the question to you now, how far would that go uh, in DD, this uh, earmark uh, that the government has uh, made in talking about the 500 billion Naira to uh, for palliatives, how far would that go with, at addressing these issues? Do you think it will make certain changes? Well, there's a, a few challenges that have affected the palliative distribution. The first is a lack of data. Uh, unfortunately, in Nigeria, we haven't captured where most vulnerable are and how to reach them. Even with our school fee feeding programs, we often see distortions. So the, the, there's an urgency to have a comprehensive database of citizens to be able to track them and understand where they are and how to reach them. Otherwise, unfortunately, those who don't need the resources end up getting them. Um, and unfortunately, that reduces the efficiency and effectiveness of distribution. I believe in the power of working with NGOs and faith-based organizations to reach those who are most vulnerable. Because in every city, in every state in Nigeria, in every town, there's either a church or a mosque um, and, or an NGO. And these are more effective mechanisms instead of the government building its own parallel distribution network. The second thing I want to underscore is this point about insecurity. We urgently need to address the insecurity. We found that in the most vulnerable communities and in places that are unsafe, whether it's in the urban areas, in slum communities, or whether it's in our rural areas that have been taken over by some of our uh, herdsmen farmer crisis or the Boko Haram insurgency. It's impossible to reach vulnerable groups where there's insecurity. And so we really need to address insecurity critically and have a very robust intervention that involves community policing, involves empowering traditional rulers, involves taking advantage of traditional institutions that have worked in the past and reviving them so they can work with the police networks and the military networks to address these challenges. And the final thing I'll say is climate change. Climate change is an environmental stress that is getting worse across Nigeria. Loss of land and water, drought and flooding. And last year, five states were underwater. They also man-made contributions. If we do not address climate change and have a comprehensive mitigation and adaptation strategy for our country, this year will even be worse. And I'm not a doomsday, but I'm saying that we've seen what's happened in Texas. We've seen what's happened in Nigeria with flooding and drought. And it is with us, climate change is upon us. And yet every single year, our country is not ready to protect our farmers, to protect our people, to ensure food security. And so this is something that we really have to take seriously leading into the rainy season and leading into the time when our farmers should be preparing the land for the new seeds. Now, if we are to address this holistically, like she is uh, pointing, talking about, where do we begin to address this? If we say the safety net programs cannot really address this issue. Uh, there was a recent uh, report that uh, the federal government want to audaciously mechanize or introduce programs that will bring mechanization to the agri space. Uh, currently, less than 10% of our agri, uh, 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 what happens in the agri space is mechanized. So we still practice primitive, subsistent, and uh, uh, very, very, very on uh, agri programs that do not scale. So we recognize that urgently, if you go to Kenya and other parts of Africa, they have embraced mechanization. So it's very urgent. We should have done it like yesterday, but we should introduce it with private sector led schemes. Access to credit also, because we can't do agriculture with uh, double-digit lending. Secondly, storage facilities. Right. At a time you buy tomato, a basket may be less than 1,000. At another time, it's going to 25,000 or 20,000. 
we must design pro storage programs that ensures that we, we have the best, one of the best arable lands all over the world. And we have fertile land, even without using uh, fertilizer and other inputs. So we must have come up initiatives that ensure that during the harvest season, we preserve enough. A lot of wastage also happen in our space, in the yes. agric space here. Yeah. So we must, and that can also be an area that the private sector, working with NGOs, as she pointed out, sexual sector players, put in place a program that ensures that when this pro uh, produce, uh, when this produce, is, um, we have them in, in the bumper harvest period, we preserve them. Secondly, it's also important to ensure that access to the market, because most people produce, they don't even take it to places where they can have enough returns. So that discourages investment in agriculture without foreign investment on local. Most people are very willing and eager to put funds into agriculture. But at the end of the day, I've seen persons who have done it, gone into planting plantation and all of that. At the end, they come back and see that the returns are near zero, and they, they, they quit. So we must also design programs that will deal with that. And very importantly, processing. So we are doing primary activity essentially in agri. The, those who are employed in agri space are, less, are probably over 80% in primary production. We must go into secondary production processing. That's where the returns will come and people will feel uh, excited well, being in agri. A lot of people have been talking about this secondary production as well as storage in Didi. And uh, you have been playing in the private sector for a while now. What are the challenges uh, that uh, perhaps you encounter and what is the level of engagement within go with government? Uh, because uh, Pascal here is talking about government working hand in glove with the private sector to move the agricultural sector forward. So through our company Ace Foods, we actually work with 10,000 farmers across Nigeria, sourcing spices and flowers and grains. Now the challenge we see is that that market linkage um, is not there. We often have to find the farmers ourselves, put them into clusters and train them. Very low hanging fruit is for every state in Nigeria to actually have a comprehensive census of their farmers, what their farmers produce and where they are located to make it easy for a private sector that's committed to backward integration to find these farmers and to work collaboratively with them to make sure that the standards are met. So there's traceability, there's food safety. The second is the challenge around transportation in Nigeria. The cost of transportation is extremely high. It's very, very expensive to bring trailer loads of uh, food from the north to the south. In fact, somebody once told me that it's easier to import from the UK and it's cheaper to bring in a container from the UK than it is to bring in a trailer from Kanu. Now we have to address the transportation cost and the bottlenecks in our transportation network. And finally, the challenge around distribution. You know, it's amazing that we still operate in very fragmented markets across Nigeria. Building a strong distribution channel is very difficult, very expensive. Where there's a challenge around proudly Nigerian products, for people to recognize that food processed in Nigeria is better quality than food imported into the, this part of the world. So changing that mindset is important. Also addressing the cost of production. We need mechanization, but we also need fabricators to make high quality equipment for our primary processors and our secondary processors. We also need to reduce the cost of energy uh, and use more renewable energy, which is not easy for small processors, right? Because most of these renewable energy uh, approaches are quite expensive. And so we need to come up with more innovative uh, approaches. We need collaboration across the entire sector, prioritizing the Nigerian processes and actually putting in place a policy that institutes requires 50% local sourcing for multinationals, for institutional buyers, for our schools and prisons and school feeding programs, saying if you don't buy from Nigerian uh, producers and Nigerian processors, we will not buy from you. That 50% local sourcing strategy is what we need in Nigeria. It's worked in Brazil, and I think we should actually enforce it in the Nigerian context as well. From what you have said, um, some would say that perhaps these are long-term, uh, this is a long-term outlook to addressing the issues. In the short term, how do we begin? Because we still have the pandemic very much with us and something has to be done as quickly as possible with the statistics you re reeled out earlier. There are two things that we urgently need. I've addressed, I've said the security over and over again. I currently work in five states in northern Nigeria with a dairy development program. And, and, uh, 
program is always threatened by security. You, you cannot unlock the actual people if you cannot get to them, and the farmers cannot get to their farms. So this is urgent, and this is something we can do right now. The country needs a comprehensive approach to addressing the header farmer crisis and to securing agriculture assets. It's not difficult because we know where the corporates are. Let's find them and let's make a swift, decisive and collaborative interventions. The second is this issue of storage, warehousing and an early warning system. We are entering the rainy season and yet our government does not have an early warning system against flooding, against drought and against starvation. We need that data, we need to raise an alarm, and we need the reserves, the grain reserves and the warehousing to ensure that we have decisive approaches to find those who need help and to help them exactly when they are in, in urgent crisis. We've seen other countries do this, not just in America, in Morocco. They haven't had one disruption during COVID-19. In Rwanda, everybody who's hungry has been fed during COVID-19. These are countries that are much smaller than us, and we can learn from what they've done. They have data, they know how to reach their people, they have systems and structures. There is no excuse why Nigeria is where it is today. All right, let's bring the conversation to the studio now. She just mentioned something, that there is no excuse uh, why Nigeria is where it is today, especially with regards to food uh, security. And she also mentioned learning from other countries. Is it so difficult for us to do? We see these countries, we go there. I mean, we know them because uh, they are policymakers and we have relationship with these countries. Why is it so challenging to adopt perhaps one thing that they are doing that could work for us? I think uh, you, if you recall, the central bank has designed several programs uh, to, of intervention schemes yes. uh, from uh, the ones that we are targeted for at corporate organizations to individuals. But the output, at the end of the day, it does not translate to significant uh, impact in the country's uh, agri uh, sector. sector. One key thing I think uh, that is lacking is we do not deploy mechanic um, monitoring evaluation strategy when we are coming up with policy initiatives. We do not dimension what impact assessment that we are supposed to be achieved and put measures in place. So at the end of the day, you see 300 billion spent on a particular scheme, 400 billion, 100 billion, and at the end of the day, we remain where we are. And so one, from the policy side, they, are, they must reconstruct, there must be a paradigm shift in the way and manner those initiatives are designed. Secondly, government must come up with quick win measures Mm. especially incentives that will come to farmers now that we see that the situation is an emergency. And she pointed out about the likelihood of flooding because what's happened in Texas may play out here. Our own will be in flooding. Mm. So we, the government we need to provide support on that. And finally, cooperative. So doing it in silos may not achieve so much. You can synergize group of people coming together who produce related pro, uh, agri products. They come together, they will be able to assess finance, they will be able to assess storage facilities, they will be able to assess the market, and they will be able to assess off-takers because I just want to end that off-taker issue is a fundamental issue in Nigeria. Right. We have, we produce more tubas of yam in Nigeria than Ghana, but Ghana sells more internationally. So we must come to a strategically plan and collaboration between social sector, private sector, and, and the government. public sector is critical. All right, uh, Didi, quickly before we let you go, uh, some have said uh, that uh, digitalization of agriculture is a, to be a global requirement needed to accelerating uh, food security. Your last word on that, if it is something we can adopt moving forward. Definitely, we need to embrace digitalization, big data, and all the innovations that are already working across the board and have started being implemented in Nigeria but need to be scaled. Um, there's so much innovation in seed systems, in production, in processing, and the use of digital is allows us to leapfrog and triple our yields and reduce our post-harvest losses and enhance our processing. The good news, though, is that tomorrow um, we're actually having a Nigerian Food Systems Dialogue as part of the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, and a lot of these issues are going to be discussed, and hopefully the sense of urgency that we've uh, explored this morning will be reinforced by both actors in the public and private sector. We're collaborating 
inventing a new way to try to see if we can come up with creative approaches to address these food insecurity challenges in Nigeria. So I'm hopeful that we're going to have a new burst of energy and great ideas tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Ndidi Nguneli, founder, Leap Africa, managing partner, Sahel Consulting, Agriculture and Nutrition Limited. We must also thank you, Pascal Atunini, CEO Health Emergency Initiative.